Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Dayan Chita. What is Zen enlightenment? Uh, so I I, uh, I recently read a, a brand new book, The Nature and Rationale of Zen Chan Enlightenment, The Mind of a Prenatal Baby by Ming Dong Gu. So, so this book argues that, that Zen or Chan isn't a sect within Buddhism, but is instead a distinct religious tradition, mostly Taoist in origin, and beginning not with Bodhidharma, but with Wiene, and mostly influenced by Zhuangzi. So part of the argument contrasts the different goals of meditation. He writes that India Dhyana is a quieting exercise aimed at mental relaxation and inner peace, and the Mahayana Buddhist version of Dhyana focuses on cultivating prajna through realizing emptiness or shunyata, seeing the interdependent arising of all things. But Chan enlightenment, according to the book, begins with Huineng and is a momentary return to prenatal mind, Taoist in nature, and it originates in uh, Zhuangzi Zhuawang, forgetting while sitting in meditation, aiming at no mind, thought, nothingness, etc. So the book claims that Chan or Zen enlightenment is and is only a, a temporary return to the preconceptual mental state of a fetus in the womb. Hence the various metaphors about seeing one's original face or your original mind. So this difference accounts for the different descriptions of enlightenment in the classic Chan masters and their irreverence uh, to, regarding Buddha and Buddhist traditions when reading Wineng or Linji, you know, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill the Buddha, that sort of thing. So I, I wasn't convinced by the book, though. Uh, it likes to quote the, the Xin Jin Ming poem as a Zen, but not Buddhist poem. But one of my favorite Lojong slogans, uh, inspired by that, by that poem's not to, is uh, all dichotomies are false dichotomies. So I believe that these supposedly different uh, kinds of enlightenment can be reconciled. So by enlightenment, he means bodhi. And I'm going to translate that as awakening instead. Because enlightenment makes it sound like a final state rather than a process. Uh, to apply Immanuel Kant's description of the 18th century in a slightly different context, we can live in an age of enlightenment without living in an enlightened age. So, so having enlightenment experiences isn't necessarily equivalent to being enlightened. Uh, so another way to view the prenatal baby uh, uh, view of awakening is to see this not as the end goal, but just as another form of awakening experience, like attaining some specific insight or a stage in the jhanas. That's great and quite helpful along the path, indeed seen as necessary step within Zen practice, but it's still just and experience. But what if we think of awakening as a process leading to being fully awake, full bodhi, as it were? We see it differently. So the Korean Zen tradition captures this with uh, sudden awakening, gradual cultivation. I interpret that sudden awakening as an awakening experience. And possibly it is like returning to the mind of a prenatal baby. It does mean temporarily breaking through the conceptual dualistic mind but an awakening experience doesn't mean you're awake. If I slightly open one eye while still shielding it against the bright light, I'm having an awakening experience, but I'm not awake in the Buddhist or the Zen sense. I'm not Bodhi. So instead of Chan or Zen being a, a completely separate tradition from Buddhism, we can just as easily think of Zen as being the sect within Buddhism that believes sudden awakening experiences are necessary and important steps towards being fully awake and that everything you need is inside you rather than dependent on externals like recitations or rituals. But there's still all the wisdom and compassion that need to be cultivated before one is fully awake even in the Zen sense. So having an awakening experience, looking into one's mind and temporarily, at least, becoming like a fetus, doesn't exclude cultivating wisdom and realizing emptiness. The specifically Zen feature of awakening doesn't necessarily exclude other more traditional uh, parts of awakening. So indeed, Winning talked about experiencing no mind or no thought, 
But he was also first awakened from hearing the Diamond Sutra, which ends, quote, as a lamp, a cataract, a star in space, an illusion, a dewdrop, a bubble, a dream, a cloud, a flash of lightning. You all created things like this. So one way to read that is of a description of interdependent arising. And experiencing this is experiencing shunyata or emptiness. So that's not the only false dichotomy. So even if awakening is a return to the prenatal mind, instead of seeing awakening as just the temporary experience of feeling as if one was back in the comfort of the womb, perhaps awakening or being awake is a more permanent experience of being so aligned with the great way, to quote Jin Jin Ming, that you feel the entire world is your world, or rather that you're as comfortable out in the world as you were in the world. Uh, to one who is fully awake, perhaps distinguishing between world and womb is a difference that doesn't make a difference. Also, even though the book discusses the potential usefulness of Chan enlightenment for ending people's mental suffering, it doesn't talk about compassion as a Zen goal. And even within Zen, compassion is a necessary component, especially if we especially if we think about compassion as the Sanskrit karana, not as feeling the suffering of others, but in the sense of wishing an end to the suffering of others. So what is the goal of awakening? It's not just to see your original face before you were born. Why would you care about that? Well, you care about that because awakening, both sudden and gradual, helps end your suffering, your dukkha. Uh, the ultimate goal of everything we do is the end of dukkha. That's what the Buddha taught, dukkha, the end of dukkha. And what completely ends our dukkha isn't awakening experiences or brief moments of seeing our original mind as if we were prenatal babies. What ends our dukkha is being fully awake all the time, carrying that wisdom and joy and compassion of that experience out into the world and everything we do. Uh, so a lot of people believe Chatter Zen is very influenced by Taoist thought, uh, I do. Uh, but what those Chan masters didn't do or didn't exclusively do is sit all the time engaging in no thought or no mind like fetuses in the womb. Now, like the Buddha, they shared what they knew and experienced in order to help other people awaken. So all the Zen masters we know of taught others. Indeed, that's why we know of these Zen masters at all. They felt a need to relieve the suffering of others by encouraging them to awaken. So that, that's Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism. And it seems to me that Zen develops that with perhaps differing emphases in other sects, but is still part of Mahayana Buddhism and not something separate. So these distinctions, as ultimately false as they might be, can help, uh, uh, or at least as I think they are, can help guide our practice. So what does it mean to practice Zen? Is it about employing meditative techniques to look into our own minds and have brief moments of seeing our original mind, perhaps like a fetus? Sure, uh, that's about as distinctively Zen as it gets. But is that all? If that's all Zen is, if awakening is just periodic, momentary returns to the mental state of the womb, that seems like a small accomplishment overall. Being awake, full awakening, bodhi, being able to say like the Buddha, I'm awake, means carrying that out into the world, taking that purity of mind, the purity of intention, and living with it all the time with the goal of helping others achieve the same thing so they too can end their dukkha. Until I can do that, uh, I would never say I'm awake or even I'm enlightened. I mean, I probably wouldn't say it even then. So the book, The Nature and Rationale of Zen, Zen Chan Enlightenment, uh, The Mind of a Prenatal Baby, is a provocative book uh, uh, full of interesting insights and I, I highly recommend uh, reading it. But because it creates these false dichotomies of dhyana and shunyata versus a return to the fetal mind and of womb versus world, and because it neglects the obvious tradition of Zen masters compassionately teaching others so that they may awaken and end their dukkha, I ultimately disagreed with most of it. Uh, nevertheless, because, of its, because it uh, stimulated my own thinking on the subject so much, I still say to the author, thank you for your teaching. And I say thank you for listening.